Welcome to Exiles. My name is Walter Martinez, and I'm so glad that you could join us in this journey through the book of 1 Peter. I want to let you know that there are a few things from the outset before we go into 1 Peter chapter 4 that you should know in case this may be your first time joining us. Number one, you can see the website at the link provided below, and you can go and download our handout for this evening. But you can also look at previous archives so that you can see um, the lessons that we've done in the past and that way be able to go through this journey at your own time and in your own, at your own pace. So excited that you have that opportunity to be able to do that. Now number two, tonight what I'm gonna provide for you is uh, three things. One, I'm gonna give an introduction. Actually, I'm gonna pray. And then I'm gonna give an introduction. And then finally, we'll do an outline of what we're gonna study. But the real depth comes after I'm done speaking. You see, I'm just kind of setting the stage. But you get to go through this, and you get to go through it with God's help and the Holy Spirit guiding you, understanding that it's God's word speaking to your heart for such a time as this. Peter's speaking to a group of individuals who are called the exiles, the ones who are scattered throughout the then known kingdom. They needed God's help for their particular situations they were living in. They believed that Jesus was coming back and they were living a lifestyle that glorified him before Christ's return. I think that that speaks loudly. It speaks loud and clear to us living in this day and age as well. We're living with the anticipation of Jesus coming back soon and we've got a lot in common with the people of Peter's day. So I encourage you to download the handout and be a part of this experience with us. Now, I do want to let you know that there are some places that are meeting live and you can get more from the discussion that takes place in these churches. If you're in the Oklahoma City area, look up Central SDA. And if you're in the Choctaw area, look up Choctaw SDA. They meet 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings and you can be a part of that as well. Go ahead and download that handout. You're going to need it. Now, as promised, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and we're going to go ahead and go into this lesson for tonight. So let's pray. God in heaven, I want to thank you for the privilege to be able to study your word and to dive into what it is that you're teaching us for such a time as this. Lord, you know you've created us with the desire to be with you. We can't fill that desire with other things of this world because it just doesn't satisfy. So tonight I pray that you would speak to our hearts and you'd speak into our lives and that you'd help us to remember that we are exiles. This world is not our home, that we're longing for something better, but before we can go home, we have a responsibility to bring as many people as we can with us to your kingdom. Now, I pray that you'd bless us that we, as we journey back into the subject of suffering. May we trust you and may we learn from Peter's words Lord, may they be your words speaking to us this day, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Excellent. So, I want to begin with a question. Um, have you ever had to do something grueling or painful in order to obtain something great? Right? I mean, when we were younger, do you remember your parents saying that you had to finish all of your vegetables and everything on your plate before you could have dessert? Right? I mean, we do that to our kids and they feel like it's so grueling, it's so horrible. It's the worst thing and I'm thinking, this is nothing. <laughs> or when you got older and uh, you had finals, you'd spent a whole week studying and preparing to take all those exams so that you could finally finish and go on summer break. Maybe it was uh, saving up for that car and you had to work countless hours to get just the right amount of funds to be able to go and purchase your very first vehicle. Regardless of what it was, the principle is still there. Sometimes it takes uh, enduring some pain and some suffering in order to obtain that thing that we really want, that we long for. I think that sometimes we often forget that the things that we cherish or the things that we really hold dear, we first had to work pretty hard to get or endure some pain and suffering in order to obtain it. I think the reason for that is, number one, we have an enemy who's, who's kind of pulled the wool over our eyes to make us think that this world is all that there is, and this world has everything that we have to offer, that this world has everything to offer us, and we don't need anything else. We don't need to think about higher things or 
spend that quality time with God because we can have everything we want. Even our society or our culture teaches us to expect things now. Isn't that crazy? We can just put all these things on our credit card and experience the joys and the happiness that comes with all these new gadgets, all these new things, all this new clothing, only to find that, you know, the month's end when we have to pay for all of this, it's painful. We forget that the things that we hold dear, we have to work for and we have to um, put effort and energy. And yes, it is a little painful. It is a little bit of suffering waking up in the morning, going to work or going to school or going to do what it is that you do. But the alternative is far worse. And trying to satisfy ourselves with the things now ends up costing us quite a bit more. So as we go into this lesson for tonight, I want to paint a picture, this introduction, if you will, that helps us to see that though we live in a sinful world and though we have an enemy who, who has kind of put just this filter over us to cause us to think that this world is all that we have and, and, and that we can even blame God when there's suffering in the world. No, I think it's important to let God be able to speak into our lives and to show us that though there is sin in this world, He can use the brokenness to bring us back to Him. He can use the brokenness to provide beauty. And I think one of the best stories that helps us to comprehend this, if we look at it in a nutshell, is a story that we find in Genesis chapter 3 at the very outset of our world's experience. It's the section where God is pronouncing curses, supposed curses upon the serpent, upon uh, woman, and upon man. So I invite you to take your Bible and uh, I'll be looking at it from the New Living Translation. It'll be on the screen, but I, I would like you to look at it in your own version so that you can kind of look at it, highlight the portions that speak to you. Because while many people look at them as curses, and in fact the Bible uses the word curse, I believe that they're actually blessings in disguise. Don't believe me? Well, let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and look at this together. Genesis chapter 3. Let's look at the curse of the serpent. Here we are in verses um, 14, I believe, and 15. Let me go up a little bit. 14 and 15. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, you are cursed more than all the animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility, or enmity, between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, you may already know this, but the serpent's curse became a promise for our salvation. Jesus was the offspring, and he was, you know, struck by the serpent. He did die but he rose to life and ended up crushing the power, supposed power that our enemy Satan has. Satan has no power now. Jesus is the true victor. So, I mean, even right there, there's a promise, there's a blessing that came in spite of the curse that was placed upon the serpent. But let's continue, there's more. To the woman, God said to her in verse uh, 16, let's go down to verse 16. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to, con to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And you can read that in your own translation. That's the New Living Translation. Notice the former part, though, the part about childbearing, uh, giving birth, painful. Um, there's a lot of pain involved in that childbirth. I, I don't know the actual pain that comes with giving birth. Um, Heather's the one that went through that twice. I experienced a different kind of pain. Um, not nearly what she experienced, but it was, it was traumatizing. It was scary. And uh, I'm glad that it's over. But when, when baby Mia was born, she's our first, she's our oldest. Uh, she's the eldest in, 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 in her sibling. Um, 
when Mia was born, all of that was immediately pushed aside. All the pain, all the suffering was pushed aside. Heather would tell you a million times over that it was worth it. The result was worth it. The blessing of having a child was so much more beautiful than the pain that came in the childbirth. Um, but then comes man. We got to look at man. So let's continue. In verse 17, it says this. And to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made, for you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. You're probably looking at that thinking, Pastor Walter, what good could come from that? I mean, I've shown you how the promise uh, of a Savior came through the curse of the serpent. Now the promise or the beauty in a child came at the end of the result of giving birth to the child. How could there be anything good from the things that, Jesus, that God said to man? Well, here's what I find fascinating. For starters, I can't tell you how many times I've heard or even watched guys celebrate after putting themselves through some grueling, difficult situations, maybe it's working hard alongside one another to build something or to, I mean, I've watched guys help me move and granted I was part of the process too, but they were the ones doing the heavy lifting because, I mean, look at me, right? And, and at the end of it all, I mean, there's this sense of accomplishment, this, this opportunity to celebrate in the things that we have done. Men were made to get things done. It's our genetic build up. We love uh, to see the work of our hands. We feel lost if we don't have a job, um, if we're not contributing in some form, shape uh, to the provision of our families. So it's, it's both odd and yet so wonderful. God in his infinite wisdom has been able to take uh, the pain and the suffering that we experience here on earth and still make good out of it. Even to this day, through the pain and through the suffering, God draws us closer to Him and helps us to learn the satisfaction that comes from enduring and working through the trials and difficulties of life. So, having given that little bit of an introduction, I now want to shift gears and talk about the outline for the study that you're going to be going through, whether you're in Central, Choctaw, or in the comfort of your own home. Here's what the outline looks like. You can see it on the handout as well. Now, last week we studied how Jesus entered into our suffering so that we might enter into his suffering. We touched on the fact that we're called to a ministry of reconciliation, which means that that ministry that we're doing on behalf of God is, in a sense, going through the sufferings of what Jesus went through so that more people could enter the kingdom. As other people see us in our suffering, allowing God to work in us, allowing God to help us out the other side, they then want what we have. They want Christ. They long for that relationship with Him, though they don't even know it. So as we maintain and stay firm in our relationship with Him, others, through what they see in us, want to be drawn closer to God as well as they see that it is possible to live in a world of suffering and yet to do it with rejoicing. So this evening, we'll see how Peter describes, uh, number one, that there is a blessing in suffering for God. And number two, that if we should suffer, well, it's best to suffer as a Christian than to suffer as a sinner. It's better to suffer as Christians than to suffer as sinners. That's why in verse 12, now we're getting into the outline, verse 12 makes it a point that we shouldn't be surprised when we experience trials in our life. And that instead in verse, seven, in verse 13, it teaches us that we should rejoice. I know it sounds kind of weird, but you're going to have to look at it and see what the Holy Spirit is saying through that section of 1 Peter chapter 4. We should rejoice when we face trials. And even, verse 14 teaches us, to consider it a blessing. Hmm, interesting, right? Now, in the latter part 
of the chapter, we're instructed to suffer as Christians, not as sinners. So verses 15 through 19 are going to help us to see the difference. The difference between suffering for God or just merely suffering because we're facing the consequences of the things that we've done to ourselves. I mean, Peter even talks about being refined through suffering. Judgment. For example, it plays a, a, a very important role in all of this. And, and not all judgment is bad. I mean, remember the prophets of old would come to, to different kingdoms and they would prophesy the things that were going to be taking place. Essentially, they were, they were pronouncing judgment. Uh, um, sorry, his name just skipped my mind. Jonah. Jonah walks up to Nineveh and he pronounces judgment. You know, it's, it's like a warning. You guys have been doing horrible things. God is going to bring down all this stuff on you. This led to a time of reform and change. God uses these judgments as wake-up calls for us to help us realize that we need to change. And yes, change is painful and it causes some suffering, but it is worth it. So, there you have it. Suffering as a Christian is far better than suffering as a sinner. We suffer or endure to receive the things that we work hard for, the things we long for. The reality is we long for a better home. We long uh, for the life that we were created to live. Now, don't get me wrong. I want to clarify some things here. Only Jesus can provide salvation. He is our salvation. And only the Holy Spirit can provide the strength that we need to endure the trials and the tribulations. But if we're going to go through this, the hardship, the difficulty, the pain, and the suffering, we have to recognize that it's us who's going to be feeling the suffering, and we're the ones who are going to be feeling the pain. So we have to recognize that it is going to be tough. We have Jesus and we have the Holy Spirit to help us through. So, may you, as we now transition into this time of study, may you see that God can bring good from our suffering, from our pain, the trials, and the tribulation. That through this, God can draw us closer to Him, closer to others, and even so much closer to the day of His return. Blessings as you take time to study this evening, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you.